Hey all, thanks so much for joining. Welcome to Microsoft Ignite. Um, welcome to day one of Microsoft Ignite. We're super excited to have you guys join us here today. Um, I'm Kat and Sarah and I today will be moderating this event. Um, and today we'll be talking about the cloud is more than just that thing in the sky. And we have two wonderful speakers here with us today. Um, Heather Brevard, who's an Azure App Dev Specialist and Michael Aldrich, who is a program manager too, and they'll be going over what exactly is the cloud. Um, but before we jump into that, I wanted to point out that um, in the Q&A section, we have the Microsoft Code of Conduct, so please take a look at that. Um, and yeah, let's dive right in. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kat, for that intro. Um, like Kat mentioned, my name is Heather, um, and I'm here with my partner in crime, Michael. Um, the two of us go way back to our childhood days and nowadays um, the last couple of years I've been a developer here at Microsoft. So I'm the type of person that would do a lot of building things on the cloud. Right now in my role I help a lot of healthcare customers understand how they can build things in the cloud and really take advantage of it. And Michael being a program manager over in Azure, he actually um, builds the cloud itself, right? So you get a unique perspective from the two of us today from someone that does a lot of building on the cloud and someone who does a lot of building the actual cloud itself. Um, so we're gonna dive right in and give you a real overview of what the cloud is, why we need it, and what, what actually is it, like what components compose it. And then we're gonna get into a demo of how you as a developer can actually take advantage of the cloud for your applications today. So what is it when we talk about the cloud? Well, when we talk about these things called cloud services, what we really mean is the delivery of games, apps, websites, any sort of code really over the internet. And we'll get into why that's important and how that revolutionized the industry in recent years. So the cloud can be a kind of complex topic to understand. So when we start to explain it to people, we always like to take a step back and use an analogy. So the cloud is sort of like the power grid of the technology industry. So imagine this, you go way back to about, you know, let's say 200 years ago, and you wanna make a grilled cheese sandwich. Well, this is back before the time of electricity or the power grid. So back then to heat up your cheese, you would have needed to make a fire. But what do you need to make a fire? Well, back then you probably would have needed some sort of matches or flint to get the flame started. Then you would have needed kindling to get a small flame going. Some sort of wood or logs to continue to keep the flame going once you've got it started some way to actually put out the fire when you're done so you don't start your whole house on fire. And of course, throughout all of this, you would have needed to know how to start a fire in the first place, which isn't necessarily the most intuitive thing if you've never done it before. But now flash forward to today, whenever we wanna make a grilled cheese sandwich, right? You take your two pieces of bread, and if you're like me from Wisconsin, your eight pieces of cheese, and all you have to do is go ahead and put it on a stove, make sure that stove is plugged in to some sort of electrical source or gas source and turn it on and voila, there you have a, a perfect grilled cheese sandwich. But that's really not the whole story, is it? No, that's all you have to worry about. But really, if you get down into it, right, there's all sorts of things going on behind the scenes. Like there's some sort of fuse box in your home that would be distributing electricity throughout your home. There's power lines that are distributing electricity throughout your city. And of course that all traces back to some sort of power plant that's actually generating this electricity for you. But at the end of the day, all you really care about is that if you turn your stove on, it's going to heat up your grilled cheese sandwich. So what does that have to do with the cloud? Well, the cloud is like the power grid in that once upon a time, we as developers used to have to worry about how are people going to access our game on the internet or our website, right? What did that process look like before we had the cloud? Well, you'd have to write code, right? Actually write the application or the website or the game that you want people to be able to access. Then if you want people to be able to go to a web browser and you know hit the internet and see what you had created, you'd first have to buy a lot of computers. And you'd have to buy these computers because your code needs to run somewhere in order for someone to access your application. 
So you'd buy all of these computers, which we call servers. Then you'd store the computers in this big warehouse, right? You can't just leave them lying out on the street. They have to be stored somewhere. You'd have to connect them to a network for the internet. You have to hire people to maintain, fix, secure the computers, right? Keep them safe, keep them well maintained. And as more people start using your application, right? More people go out to your website and see the cool application that you've built. You'd have to buy even more computers and store them in more warehouses and hire more people to maintain and fix them. And maybe someday one of your warehouses burns down and it, you have to start all over, right? You have to build that warehouse, buy all those computers all over again. And in the meantime, no one can reach your app because your code isn't running anywhere for someone to be able to access it. So nowadays with the cloud, we've eliminated a lot of that overhead, right? A lot of those extra things you have to do to make sure that people can access your application. Nowadays, all you have to do when you want someone to be able to access an app on the internet is write the code, pay another company to rent their resources, right? Rent what is in their data centers and voila, it's that easy, right? You can focus on developing more stuff. No more having to worry about buying all these things and knowing how to set up all of your warehouses and, and your infrastructure in that way. So really, at the crux of it, why do we need the cloud? Well, the cloud, first of all, makes it a lot cheaper for me as a developer in my bedroom to create something that other people can access, right? I don't have to worry about buying all these expensive computers and maintaining them. I just pay someone else to do it for me. It's also way more efficient and it's highly scalable so that as more and more people are accessing my app, instead of having to buy more computers and more warehouses and hire more people, all I really have to do is just rent more resources from the company that is my cloud provider. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Michael now, who's gonna give you some intel on what actually makes up the cloud and how do we use it. Awesome, thanks Heather. So hello everyone, um, like Heather mentioned, uh, my name is Michael, I'm a program manager um, in Azure. So my team actually builds um, two cloud resources and we'll kind of um, deep dive into what it means to, uh, to rent a resource and use a resource. Um, so my team builds Express Route in Azure Bastion. Um, and what we're gonna do now is actually um, dive into the conceptual side of cloud computing, cloud services. And so the first thing we wanna uh, make sure is understood is at the end of the day, Cloud services map to physical infrastructure, physical IT resources. And so if you look um, at a cloud provider such as Microsoft Azure, and this is what we're viewing right here, this is a map of all of the different data centers that Microsoft Azure maintains. And so like Heather mentioned, cloud services really is renting IT infrastructure, renting those resources to deliver your application, to deliver your website over the internet. When we talk about that exchange of I'm renting a resource, that resource is actually being run in one of these data centers. And so if you look at this map, it's global. When you rent a resource, you can rent it from somewhere um, close to Seattle uh, on the West Coast in the United States, or you could rent it from somewhere in Europe. And so the, the magnitude of cloud services and, and how um, cloud providers need to operate is really large. Um, inside one of these physical data centers, what you'll actually see are just rows and rows of, of physical servers themselves. And so, um, Heather, if you don't mind going to the next one, um, this is what one of those physical data centers looks like. And you can see it's just a giant warehouse. There's racks of um, network gear. There's actual servers that are running um, different code that, um, that people are pretty much renting space to run on. Um, and and this, is, this is global. So Microsoft will maintain these in different areas around the world. Um, the, the other thing to keep in mind too, um, is that there's a lot of other things that goes into running this, the physical security, the maintenance, the cooling, making sure that, um, uh, people aren't getting into areas that they shouldn't be, shouldn't get into. And so the, the main idea here, the re really two big takeaways is one, when you rent a cloud resource, it, it's very easy for you to go into the Azure portal and, and create a virtual machine. But what's going on behind the scenes is you're kind of mapping some software control to an actual hardware component. And that's really where the magic of the cloud lives. And so um, now what we're going to do is, is walk you through kind of the three different resources or three different categories of cloud services. And so like Heather mentioned, and I want to keep going back to this because it's really the fundamental understanding. Cloud services is, is really just renting different IT resources over the Internet. So if you are a developer and you want to host a web application um, or maybe you want to um, make a game publicly available to the Internet, 
This, these are the different resources that you would rent to achieve that. And so there, there's really three different categories, compute, storage, and networking. And so what I'm going to do is kind of deep dive into each one, give you an idea of what it is, and then try to couple that with an example to, to try to contextualize this so you can understand it a little better. So what we're going to start with is cloud computing. Um, this one's actually pretty straightforward. It's just receiving and responding to requests for information. And we're going to unpack this a little more, but the main idea I want you to take away from this is um, when you rent a cloud resource, you are pretty much making your website, you're making your game um, able to respond to requests for information. And so if I am a consumer and I want to play your game on the website, there's going to be an exchange of me um, sending information and the compute is what processes that and then returns a response. And so let's give an example. Let's say, um, and actually did, the Series X Xbox just launched today, but let's say um, your friend pre-ordered it and you want to grab them a controller for that opening day too, just get them some Xbox accessories. And so as an example, let's say you, you browse to walmart.com. It really doesn't matter what the e-commerce is. In this example, it's Walmart. Um, and you want to go look at what purchasing that Xbox controller would be like. So there's two options here. You can see there's a search bar up top. You could type in Xbox and hit enter. That would bring you to the Xbox page. You also see there's a controller right here, um, a white controller that you could click, and that would also direct you to the correct page. What's actually happening behind the scenes, if Walmart was running this website um, on Azure and they were renting compute resources to help run it, um, they would actually spin up what we call a virtual machine or some sort of compute resource, and they would um, deliver code or write code on that virtual machine to say, hey, when someone clicks this Xbox controller, I'm going to respond with the information that they want to see to proceed purchasing. And so it, it's that exchange that we, we've, we've gone back to where I am saying, hey, I want some information. And the compute, is, the compute resource is taking in that request, processing it, and then it's responding with the correct material. The next thing we're going to talk about is storage. Um, I think this one's a little straightforward, um, a little easier to understand because we store things on the, all the time. Um, but effectively, what storage is as, as a student, as a developer, as an Azure customer, when you rent storage resources, you are just renting a physical space um, to actually store your assets. And so if we go back to that Walmart example, let's say I clicked that, um, that white controller logo and it brought me to the Walmart page with all of the different information about the Xbox controller. Um, this is what I would see. So you can see there's different bundles, there's different descriptions, there's text, there's so much different information that uh, Walmart is presenting on this page, um, they have to store this somewhere. And so when that compute resource receives the request to be able to display all this information, it then needs to be able to pull that information from somewhere. It has to pull the images, has to pull the pricing information. And so that's where storage comes into play. The last thing that kind of connects all of these together um, is networking. And so um, at the end of the day, the best way to understand networking is it's what connects the different IT resources together. And so as a customer, if you're renting a cloud compute resource, if you're renting a storage resource, the way you would configure networking is to actually connect the two. So back to our Walmart example, when you clicked into that um, controller page, there has to be some sort of thing that interfaces um, the website with, with all of the information about the controller. And so the databases that are storing, storing the controller information, the pricing, the text, there is a network connection that connects that database to whatever compute resources running the website. Um, behind the scenes too, I want, I want to step back and talk about the physical side again. Um, what's really powerful about cloud services and specifically networking is when you rent a cloud networking service, you are actually leveraging the physical network of the cloud provider. And if you remember that map we showed at the beginning, here's another view of it. All of the different data centers that you were able to rent resources from Microsoft actually maintains a physical fiber network um, to facilitate connectivity between. And so this is what is immensely powerful about the cloud. Before, if you wanted to host a, a game um, on the internet and make it publicly accessible to users, you would have to do all of those steps that Heather mentioned. You'd have to write, develop, buy servers, procure, manage, and then you would have to connect those servers to some sort of network to even make it accessible to the public. What is so powerful about cloud services is that you can spin up a network or spin up a server, spin up a database, spin up networking resources, and then with a few click of a button, you can make them publicly accessible to the internet um, and, and allow uh, different users to interact with your service. And so that scale is what, what we want you to take away is this idea that you are interacting with the software component, but it's a really complex um, exchange between the software and the hardware, and that's where these cloud providers like Microsoft Azure really excel. 
And so now that you have a good understanding conceptually, um, I'm going to hand it back over to Heather and we're going to run you through a demo um, to really drive this home. All right, thanks so much, Michael. So we've thrown a lot at you in a very short amount of time. And what we want to really drive home today is that you today, if you have some sort of website code that you've already created, could actually put that on the internet using a cloud provider like Microsoft Azure with relative ease. So we're going to walk through that right now. So here I am in GitHub and in GitHub I have a bunch of code and this code is basically a lot of HTML, CSS, JavaScript um, and this code creates a website and I want this website to be accessible to all of you on the internet. So I'm going to go ahead and, and clone this or copy this code onto my computer and then show you how to deploy it to Azure using something we call an app service. So I'm copying this code and then I'm using this code editor called Visual Studio to walk through this. So I've copied the code and in Visual Studio I can access the code as a website by going to open and then website. And then I can see that this is the folder that I copied from GitHub that contains all of the code that we want to deploy so that you all can access it on the internet, right? So we've got the surprise application and we're gonna deploy it to Azure. So before that we do that, I wanna show you the way that we access Azure, which is through this website called the Azure Portal. So if you go to portal.azure.com, on the internet and you create an account for yourself, a subscription essentially, you can go ahead and create all sorts of those fun compute and storage resources and many other things um, that Michael had covered. So first to get started, we're gonna wanna go ahead and create ourselves a resource group. And what a resource group basically is, is kind of like a folder that you can store all of your, um, all of your Azure resources on. And this gives you the opportunity to really group things that you want to keep together and makes it you know, similar to the file folder structure on your computer, just easier to keep track of what you have created. Awesome. So we're gonna be using Michael's subscription today. Michael was kind enough to go ahead and loan us that. So he's paying for our demo this morning. Thank you, Michael. And I'm gonna go ahead and just do Ignite Demo is the name of my resource group, right? The name of that folder that we're going to use to store all of our resources. So we've gone ahead and created that. I uh, see we have Ignite Demo here. And we're gonna go back to Visual Studio and take our surprise code here. And we're gonna right click and go to Publish Web App, right? Visual Studio makes it really easy for us to publish things directly through Azure if you've locked in and connected to your Azure account. So if I have Azure here, I can go ahead and click Next. And I want to deploy that Azure App Service that we called, that we talked about, that's gonna make it really easy for us to get this code on the internet. Oh, oh it's asking me to sign in again. We take security very seriously here at Microsoft. And double authentication, extra security, I like to see that. This way no one can break into Azure and spin up a bunch of resources on my behalf um, that I then need to pay for. So we got Michael Aldridge, it's still trying to authenticate me. Okay, great. So we want to pick create new Azure app service. So creating this new app service is what's gonna allow me to deploy this to the internet. So we'll call it Ignite Demo on Michael's subscription. I can see the Ignite Demo resource group that I created. And Michael already has this hosting plan created for us that we can use to just keep track of what we're paying for for this new service. All right, so now Visual Studio is taking care of this for us to get the app service set up 
and if we actually go back to the Azure portal um, and go into our Ignite demo group, um, we'll eventually see that show up fairly quickly here. In the meantime, do we have any questions from the audience while we're waiting for that to show up? We don't have too many. We've been sharing some resources on learning Git and GitHub. Um, there was a question around locations of data centers. Um, I don't think the exact locations are, are shared. Is that correct, Heather and Michael? Yeah, so we'll share um, the regions. And so, um, and, and we can try to follow up with some links and material there, but it'll show you um, kind of the general region that's created and so the country and kind of where that sits um, yeah. in terms of the map. Great. Awesome. Yeah. So we can see now that the app service has been created, right? That took what, a minute, two minutes? Yeah. Not very long at all. And it gives us this URL here. So if we copy this URL and see where it goes, we can see that, great, we have an app service, but this isn't the code that I had in Visual Studio. This is just a welcome message letting me know that the app service has been created for me, but I actually need to deploy my code now to make sure that what I had actually coded up appears here at this ignite demo.azurewebsites.net. And actually all of you at home, if you have access to a computer or a mobile phone right now, you can go ahead and type in ignite demo.azurewebsites.net and you'll actually see the exact same thing, right? Anyone in the world anywhere can access this now that we have this public URL here. So how do I actually get my code on here? Well, if we go back to Visual Studio, I can see that the app service has been created and I can click finish. And then I see that there's the option here to publish. And so what this is going to do is publish all of this code that I have to that app service so that we can all see and enjoy it. So I'll go ahead and click publish. And then while that's publishing, Heather, um, I just wanna take a moment to kind of go back to the conceptual side too, if you don't mind uh, going to the Azure portal. Yeah. Um, remember when we were talking about compute resources um, and that ability to receive and respond um, to information? So Heather is actually demonstrating that right now. When she deployed that code, she deployed it to um, an actual data center that's now running all of this information for you. Exactly. Thanks, Michael. So now we can see that that deployment has finished and boom, here's the code that we had for you all. We can see that we have a fun little game. That's awesome. And I'm not very But now go to ignite demo dot Azure websites dot com. You can go ahead and play the game too. I think our highest score is twelve, if I remember right. So <laughs> that was probably that, we'll be know. impressed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that's so that's awesome. ignitedemo.azurewebsites.net. So if we refresh that here, we can see even in a different browser, I can access it. You all at home can access it. People in any place around the world yeah. can access it. And you all too at home can go ahead and you know copy that code that we have. We'll have that in the GitHub for you all to access and try it yourself at home. Mm -hmm. um, and pretty much any other code that you write, right? You can learn more about how to use Azure um, and other cloud providers and just see where it goes. You can build anything. I mean, the options are really limitless here and Azure makes it really easy for you all to distribute whatever it is you build so that anyone everywhere can access it. Awesome. We do have a couple of other questions. Um, in terms of Azure scalability, is that something that an individual can leverage or is that only available to like really large corporations and companies? Yeah, so it's a great question. So um, that's actually, a, so scalability um, is available to you as a consumer. And so um, the way you would scale and how you configure that is actually more of a function of the type of resource you create in the Azure portal or you create in Azure. Um, it doesn't necessarily even have to do with uh, what you're trying to host. You can, as a consumer, can always make the decision to scale your service if you need to. Awesome. And what about things like continuous integration and continuous deployment? It, do, do Azure App Services support that or is that something completely separate? Yeah, so if you're talking about continuous integration, continuous deployment, um, there's a variety of different ways that you can architect that. 
Um, one of my favorite ways is to use something like GitHub or like Azure DevOps that makes it really easy for you to create um, easily managed continuous integration pipelines. And for those of you who don't know what continuous integration means, um, right now you just witness me manually deploy um, this code to the to the internet. You can actually set it up where any time that you make a code change or any time that you have certain criteria met, you can automatically update your website in the cloud um, through what we call this continuous integration. And so I personally recommend GitHub or, or Azure DevOps as a way to do that. Um, I believe through the Azure portal with app services, you can go into the Azure, the, the Azure portal to your app services resource and actually set up continuous integration pipelines directly from there. Um, so it'll it'll automatically pull code based on certain triggers from GitHub or, or various other sources. Great. Awesome. I think there was another question also about um, what's the difference between private and public cloud? Yeah, that's a great question. And so um, the difference is actually um, in terms of who, who can access it. And so a public cloud is actually, um, so the resources where we just deployed to for this demo, that's Azure Public. So I as a consumer, you as a consumer, anyone can create and rent resources in the data centers that are running the cloud services. Um, a private cloud is restricted. And so um, a company may have a specific private cloud. Um, they, they also may maintain their own private cloud outside of Microsoft Azure. But that question is really answered depending on who's trying to access the resources. And then it also restricts which resources are able to communicate with each other, right? So yeah. any resource that's in a in a private cloud can only interact with other resources within that that private cloud, and no external resources are able to connect to those in, in any way. So it's part of that networking component that Michael yeah. really talked about, um, where the network rules are very restricted um, in, in a private cloud as well. They can also be restricted in a public cloud, um, but that's definitely something you see in private clouds. Great point. Awesome. Um, this one might be uh, something that you can't answer, but I'm actually kind of curious as well. Um, things like SpaceX's Starlink project, which you know mm. kind of changes the way internet is is kind of like offered to folks. I'm particularly excited because I live really remote. Um, do you think that will affect how cloud services run? Um, and you you know you might not be able to answer this. Um, you're not necessarily building it, but um, right. just kind of curious what you think. Yeah. Um... No, it's a really good question too. Um, and I would actually, to answer that, go back to the physical implementation that we talked about. Remember, at the end of the day, there is physical network infrastructure that is connecting these cloud services and offering it to you as a consumer. And so different cloud providers could take advantage of new technologies that are either changing internet connectivity, maybe um, putting resources closer to the edge. And so putting data centers or putting compute services closer to you as a consumer. So it doesn't take as much kind of latency or load time for you to access those resources. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it really comes down to the way that the, the internet is set up, right? Whether you're using Wi-Fi or 5G or any of or other of the plethora of new ways that they're coming up with to network different um, machines and computers. It really doesn't matter because like the cloud as a concept is really about the delivery of the of applications over those types of networks. And um, as the Internet changes and the way that we perceive or, or receive the Internet changes, um, I'm sure the, the cloud will be adapting with that. Mm -hmm. And th there's also a question about redundancy. So, you know, you mentioned that there are these different regions, um, but what happens if, you know, for some reason the data center goes out in in my region um, or the one that I was using? Are there a redundancy um, built in? Is there? Yeah, so there is. And to, to be very kind of specific and concise here, so an Azure region um, sometimes will be made up of multiple of what we call availability zones. And so one region is actually made up of physically separate data centers that leverage different network infrastructure redundancy there as well. So if you deploy a resource um, that is scalable, it could deploy it to both zones or many zones. If one zone goes down, the other zones still facilitate your resource. Awesome, awesome. We've got about one minute left. I did want to mention that there are um, there's a link in the chat for additional resources and a survey for your feedback. Um, so we'd really appreciate it if you could fill that out. I wanted to thank both Michael um, and Heather and Kat 
for answering questions and presenting us with this um, really amazing introduction to the cloud. Um, and thank you all for joining us on this session.